you can 100% be a good person and be negatively impacting the work experience of women around you. I'm Rachel Cottom, and this is the Allies at Work podcast. Here, you'll discover bite-sized tactics that you can start using today to improve gender equity in your workplace, home, and community. In today's episode, you'll hear from Michael Harrington, marketing director and devoted girl dad. Michael and I met while working at Divi, a high growth tech company here in Utah, the US state that ranks worst for gender equality. Michael enjoys a lot of privilege based on his identity, and he's committed to doing his part to make our state a more equitable place for women, especially for his three daughters. Michael gave me the biggest aha moment in this episode when he said that the most significant roadblock to gender allyship is often other men. Interestingly, seeing other men at women's events was also one of the factors that made it easier for Michael to start his own process of unlearning. Men, this is why we need you to get involved in gender equality. Not only does it show support for women, it makes it easier for other men to get involved too. Michael also shares a lot about his female allyship mentors who have helped him understand the problems that exist in corporate spaces and what he can do about them. At the end of today's episode, I'll share an allyship tactic with you, something you can start doing right away. As Michael says, allyship is more than being a good person. Allyship is about taking action. This easy technique will help you be a better ally anytime you're in a meeting with women. Today's allyship action is called amplification. Thanks for getting curious with us. As a woman who transitioned from a female majority career to being the only woman in the office, I quickly saw that the gender biases I assumed were long gone still exist in corporate America. I've loved my time in startups, but I've also seen the need to bring men into the equity conversation, creating allies, not enemies. My male allies helped me to negotiate a 54% raise when I was out of pay parity with male counterparts. They spoke my name in rooms where the executive team was present. They gave me opportunities to participate in hiring and managing, even when I was a junior employee. They taught me how to measure to outcomes. They held space for me to lead our company's women's ERG. In those employee resource group meetings, Michael, was often the only man to show up. Here's a little bit more of his story. So I'd love to get started with a little bit about who you are, what's your story? How, how'd you get involved in this work? I've been a leader in the digital marketing space at uh, primarily technology companies for the last 10, 12 years now. And I started becoming more increasingly aware of these issues in the workplace with gender inequality when I was one of the marketing managers at Workfront. And this was my first opportunity to manage a woman on my team. I (laughs) went through the hiring process and was bringing a woman onto my team. And I was intrinsic about how to manage. I hadn't had uh, extensive management experience at that point. And so I I knew that there were issues. I didn't know what those issues were. I didn't know how to not be a part of the problem. I just knew that it was something that I didn't want to contribute to a problem that existed. At that point, there was an ERG um, at Workfront, the Women of Workfront. So I I joined that ERG. And as we would go to conferences, I would proactively look for sessions that were geared toward this. Notably at Adobe Summit, there was an entire section of the booth floor that was dedicated to conferences conversations about gender inequality. So mm-hmm. I camped there for a good two, two and a half hours and just listened to the speakers and, you know, tried to absorb as much as I could there so that I could not be part of the problem and just kind of taken off since there. I love that you said you wanted to not be part of the problem mm-hmm. and that you knew there were problems, but that you <laughs> didn't know precisely what they, what they were. So I, I think I mean, gosh, we've got to take away right away. Number one, join your women's ERG or, or be an ally. Start asking questions and be curious about what you don't know. But I would love to like back up even further there. How did you know that there were problems? Like, was it just, you know, because you were an astute member of, of society? How can people start becoming aware of that in a way that is very humble and self-reflective the, the way that you did? 
Yeah, it's a good question. I I had a female manager. Uh, she was my director at MX uh, when I was there. That was the job immediately previous to Workfront. And I saw her, the way that she handled, you know, some of the challenges in Utah, especially a lot of the teams, you know, that I've been on that I've seen have been largely male dominated. Um, yeah. And I, I respected the way that she went about asserting her area of ownership and her leadership in a company that was largely dominated by men at that point, especially at the leadership level. She was a really good example to me, not only of like how powerful and impactful women are in the workplace, but also seeing some of the challenges that she experienced that other leaders within the company didn't. Um, mm -hmm. And so that was, that was one of the earlier, you know, more eye-opening experiences. And then I saw how she, you know, led and mentored the women on her team as well. And, you know, in, in <clears throat> developing their careers and, from there, just started to see more examples, more articles come up that there mm -hmm. were these issues that, that women had challenged in the workplace that men just didn't. And so, again, just looking for ways that I could be the kind of the male version of her form of leadership, where it was really, you know, for for men and women being the right kind of leader, uh, but also specifically being cognizant of those gender challenges that there are. Yeah, very cool. I love that you had that example early on in your career that you were able to see a woman exercising her influence in a positive way mm -hmm. and asserting herself and um, being very conscious about advocating for and mentoring others. I think that's something that we see time and time again is, is those mentors, male or female, are mm -hmm. able to make an incredible impact when they go out of their way to, to sponsor women in the workplace. I think that's totally. incredible. I'd love to hear a little bit more about joining the, the women's ERG. Mm -hmm. Was that an intimidating thing for you? How did you go about that? Yeah, it, it was definitely intimidating. Fine. I had, I had, you know, a couple of close uh, female coworkers who they were, you know, heavily involved with it. They had lean in circles that they'd established. Mm -hmm. There was some of the framework was already there. There were also other, you know, other men who were involved as well. Yeah. Um, and so that you know, for me definitely helped open the door a little bit. So yeah, you, t you ask if it was intimidating, it would have been <laughs> definitely more intimidating if I was like the only guy there. So having <clears throat> some of that representation there, that there were others, that it was a place where I could be involved, I think was, was helpful. And then beyond that, it's just show up, yeah. go to the ERG meetings, go to the lean in group meetings, and then also just sharing my voice in the conversation. And so not just showing up, not just being a fly on the wall, but yeah. showing an active interest, showing active engagement so that it's clear that I'm not just there for the sake of being there, that it wasn't a platitude that it was like, yeah, I'm involved. It was like, no, I actually do want to be involved. I want to help and move this in the right direction. Yes. I love that you spoke up. You made sure that folks yeah. knew you were serious about being engaged in fact, that's one of the reasons you and I are having this conversation yeah. <laughs> is because we met, not, not only were we on the same team, but in that Women of Divi ERG, mm -hmm. I still remember the meeting that you came to first. And I think you were the only guy on yeah. that call. <laughs> and I was so grateful to have you there. I, I do wonder though, for the leaders of women's ERGs, mm -hmm. sometimes there is this question of, of should we make this a, a safe private, intimate space just for women, mm -hmm. or should we extend this out to allies? And it sounds like that that in that first ERG, they had set the precedence of mm -hmm. saying men are welcome here. And there were men who are already stepping up and doing it. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what advice though you would give to the leaders of women's ERGs. How can they balance those two needs? One, to create a safe space for mm -hmm. women to share uh, that collective experience and two, to create an opportunity for more allyship. How do you think they can achieve that balance? Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned balance. This was actually something I thought about because I I was definitely ended up being less frequently engaged in the Women mm -hmm. of Divi ERG because I feel like, like you mentioned I was the only guy in that meeting, and there were a couple you know additional meetings that I went to, and consistently the only <laughs> the only guy there. And so I yeah. I think one of the things that did stand out to me was there were there were members of the ERG who I felt, and maybe this was not actually how they were feeling, but I did feel a level of hesitation, a level of reticence on mm -hmm. their end to engage or contribute as much as 
they may have otherwise because maybe it didn't feel as safe a place for them. And so I think it is finding that balance of maybe there are certain topics, maybe there are certain, you know, discussions that are reserved to just women to have as a, you know, truly reserved, dedicated, safe place for women to rely and engage with other women. Yeah. But then understanding the value of having both genders represented there. And, you know, in terms of like I, the welcome that you gave me definitely made me feel like this was somewhere where I could, I could continue to learn, continue to develop my own ability to um, help and be an ally. And so I think the proactively engaging with men in the workplace as well on identifying Mm -hmm. what are the avenues that we can take where this is both men and women engaged and represented. And then what are, again, what do we reserve and dedicate to just a dedicated safe place for women. And I think like the lean in circles specifically at women of Workfront, I think were very impactful, you know, having men and women there because that was a, it was a smaller group. And so it was a little bit safer in that regard where, you know, there was a, a mutual commitment from everyone involved that this is a safe place, that this isn't something where, you know, you hear your coworker talk about a challenge they had, and then you go chat with your buddy about the challenge that you just heard shared with you. It was a safe place where everyone could chat, come together and understand what those actual challenges are. And so maybe it's a breakup like that where there's lean in circles are mixed and then there's other sessions that are committed to that truly safe place. Yeah, I think that's really compelling. And I I think uh, something you called out too is just setting the expectations for individual events, setting Mm -hmm. the expectations for the group. Maybe it is you want a group um, or a Slack channel that is only for the yeah. women of, of Divi, for example. Mm-hmm. And then maybe you have a women of Divi and allies channel. Yeah. So I think setting the expectations for the way that you're using events, you're using Slack channels, you're using comms. Mm-hmm. It's a lesson the universe has been teaching me over and over again, that clarity is kindness, right? Yes. <laughs> and actually setting those expectations helps us to create the right kind of space Uh, the right kind of boundaries, but also Mm -hmm. invite the right people to the conversation. I love that idea too of, you know, can, can we, as leaders of women's ERGs, can we extend personal invitations to Mm -hmm. allies, right? Can we not just shout out with a flyer or a Slack message or an Mm -hmm. email, but can we reach out to individual folks who we've already seen very interested and engaged Mm -hmm. in the space and ask those male allies to attend certain events Mm -hmm. or to be a mentor or sponsor? Yeah, that I've I personally witnessed a couple very interesting moments of clarity and kind of like I talked about my awakening for lack of a better term. <laughs> and I witnessed other people where I, I've mentioned to you a couple of times my what I consider like my allyship mentors, women yes. who helped kind of lead me and like give me at times, you know, very hard feedback about, you know, biases that I was showing even after I was like involved and engaged. And I was like, I'm, I'm one of the good ones. I'm, you know, on the right path. (laughs) And they're like, maybe, but like, here's this, 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 you know? And so I, I saw those women engage with other men to proactively invite them to things. And it was even inviting men who hadn't necessarily shown interest. And it was interesting to see some of those men respond in ways like, why would I go to that? Like these issues don't, Mm. don't exist here. I don't have these issues. And so it was interesting having those, seeing those early conversations where it's like, actually, there's a lot of issues here. And then they would pull me into conversations as well to be like, talk to this person, catch them up on, (laughs) on on Mm. what's actually going on here. And, and so it was interesting to see there were those that were, like you said, more uh, already showing some interest that it was like, yeah, I would love to join. And then others that were like, I don't think that actually happens. Like, I don't think that's actually an issue. It's like, eh, it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I love your humility and insight to recognize that. I think I, I try and give people the benefit of the doubt as often mm-hmm. as possible. Sometimes they just need their eyes open to be aware of it. Sure. In fact, when you were mentioning the men who you know, questions a a little bit. I'll embarrass one of our friends here. Tucker, when I first asked him to be a mentor, gave me a hard time about it. And I was like, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be a male mentor. What do I have to teach? Like, (laughs) I don't know anything about this space. And then as soon as I validated him, I was like, dude, you would be an incredible mentor. Like the 
insight, the advice, the coaching, the example that you could set for a junior woman in, in demand or in sales mm -hmm. would really benefit them. And, and you get the mm -hmm. benefit of, of learning from that relationship too. And then the next day he comes to work with a copy of the book, Good Guys by Brad Johnson and David Smith. And yep. I was just so, so impressed by that action that mm -hmm. even though he had been reticent, like you said, he was willing to learn. And mm -hmm. he, he bought the book and he yeah. asked me questions about it and he really wanted to improve in that space. So I think that's incredible. I'd love to talk a little bit about some of those roadblocks to allyship because yeah. it is something that men in, in the space of gender equality, even, even myself, as I'm trying to be a better ally to people of color or to mm -hmm. the LGBTQ community, there are things that are intimidating and scary. Sure. So if you wouldn't mind being a little bit vulnerable for me, sharing maybe one of the things that has scared you about allyship and maybe informing women, letting them know like, hey, this might be a reason that, that a male ally is holding back. I think that could be a really valuable insight if you don't mind sharing. Yeah. Like you said, it it can be a very intimidating thing, especially the earlier conversations, because I, I mentioned joining Women of Workfront. I didn't want it to be coming off as just a platitude that I was just there for the sake of being there, that I was actually interested. And I think the probably the biggest roadblock of allyship is probably other men, because especially w depending on your level of influence at, at the time. When I first started getting more engaged, I was a manager. I wasn't a senior manager, I wasn't a director, like I was, I was a manager. And you know, some of the big issues that I was witnessing and seeing portrayed in the workplace were by male leaders who had more seniority than I did. And so mm -hmm. when it came to actually not just learning about allyship, not just unpacking my own biases, but the inevitable result of unpacking your own biases is you become increasingly cognizant and aware of everyone else's biases around you. <laughs> and so when I, I started to see these things that I would do or things that I would say, these micro interactions that were loaded with these biases, I started to see it regularly with, with other men around me. And mm -hmm. It's, it is a hard and like vulnerable and humbling experience to take ownership and address your own. But again, when you have other leaders who, whether they're in your direct line or diagonal lines of leadership, or however you'd explain that, that becomes very intimidating to say yeah. anything or to bring it up or to figure out how to address it. And that was my, that definitely the biggest hurdle that I had to get over was developing a level of confidence and comfort in addressing it and making it clear that it is noticed and that it's the, like the reasons that it isn't okay. You mentioned Tucker as an example. I'll use Rick, Rick as an example. As a leader who I've appreciated the level of unapologetically how both Tucker and Rick with how they deal with issues like this, because mm -hmm. the way that they lead make it much less possible for any of these issues to exist in their line of sight, which I very much appreciated because when there were these little micro examples of like, I, I saw this, it's not a huge issue. I'm not ringing any alarm bells or anything, but like, I just want you guys to be aware that I saw this interaction on the team. And, and then hmm. the way that Rick responded was like, there's no room for that in any form on our team. Call it out if you see it. Like it wasn't this wow. thing where it was like, yeah, that person is a good person. They didn't mean anything. It's like, no, there's mm -hmm. no space. There's no room. Uh, and I, bravo. <laughs> yeah, bravo. Exactly. <laughs> because I think that perception of, no, they're a good person. It You can 100% be a quote unquote good person and have biases and be actively and negatively impacting the work experience of women around you. And yeah. I think that's in many ways, far more insidious than overt misogynists in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Because like overt, explicit misogynistic behaviors are likely less common. They yeah. are more egregious, but they're also way more easy to deal with and point to and resolve. Yes. It is the day-to-day -day subconscious biases that are the most, in my experience and observation as a third party observer here, <laughs> the most negatively impactful for women, because there are, those are also the interactions that, you know, push women intrinsically to question themselves, to not think that 
this is actually an issue to question whether they should be feeling offended or marginalized. And so having the example of a male leader who's like, no, there's no room for that. We don't deal with that. Call it out when you see it, address it. And I I think that was very inspiring. I think that's so critically important that leaders step up in this space because it's like you said when you were a manager or even when i was an individual contributor Mm -hmm. and like i should found this women's erg that feels scary because you don't want to come across as an aggressive or a combative person right Mm -hmm. you want to come across as somebody who's on the team and who's rooting for everyone but that unconscious bias you talked about the the benevolent sexism that is incredibly, (laughs) incredibly prevalent in Utah, where folks really, you know, they think they're good people. And they're like, I I could never, I could never do something sexist. That's not who I am. I love women. (laughs) I'm married to a woman. It's it's coming from a place of really trying to be charitable and kind. But when we're not aware, when we don't have someone like you, who's willing to call it out or a leader like Rick, who's going to be unapologetic and completely drawing a line that Mm -hmm. that we don't accept that behavior at all on this team. When that's not coming from the leader, it's incredibly intimidating for male allies, for women, for anyone to stand up. So thank you for being humble. Yeah. I would love if you wouldn't mind telling a story of when you were an ally. This is a story that I heard you share once in a mm-hmm. in a Women of Divi meeting, and it has stayed with me. I think you know which story I'm talking yeah. about. So I'll let you tell it if you don't mind, but I think it's a really important lesson for allies out there. Yeah. So this was several years ago. I found myself in a role that there's a very there's a very fine line between the role that I had and the role that one of my female coworkers had. We we worked very closely together and so you know similar projects, similar tasks, all of that. Our areas of ownership were very close. And the situation we were in, we were at a marketing all hands meeting and it was one of these big two day events. Everyone in marketing was there and so as happens work kind of slows down when, when it's all hands on deck with a a big meeting like this, but the market doesn't stop. And so there were still things that we had to get done. And so me and this coworker were working on a project. I I don't remember the specific project, but as is often the case with web projects, we can only do so much without our, you know, creative teams, without our dev teams. And so there was a specific, you know, task that we had to get out that required an ask of the creative team. And so I put together the message. It was like, Hey, we have to get this done today. It has to go out. And we're literally all in a big meeting room. Our CMO is presenting. And so I start a, a Slack chat, send the request over to one of our designers. It was like, sorry to like put you in this position, but we have to have this within the next few hours. And then after the meeting was done, me and this female coworker go over to chat with him. And it's like, Hey, I don't know if you saw this, but we need this done. And there, there was some level of hesitation there, you know, resistance. He's like, we're at this marketing all hands. Like, I don't want to be working right now. I'm trying to be engaged with what's going on here. And anyway, the ultimate result is we had this ask and it was like, no, you like, we have to have this go do it basically. Yeah. Fast forward to later that day, later that week, at some point, we were back at the at the office and on the marketing floor in hearing distance of basically the whole marketing team, this creative was actively and audibly venting to his boss, not about me, who was the one who had originally submitted the request, but about my female coworker naturally using language like bossy and the labels that get applied to women in the workplace, unfortunately. So obviously there's a number of issues with with that outside of just like gender-based issues of like, maybe don't vent to your boss audibly on the <laughs> marketing floor. Like there's some, there's some lessons there, but I think the the biggest thing for me was there was a man and a woman involved in this. And the man was actually the one who had submitted the original request and was asking for it. But between the two of them, it wasn't that the man involved was bossy or pushy or aggressive. It was that the woman involved was bossy and pushy and aggressive. So I later went to both this creative and his superior and shared the details of the situation and that it was not in fact that my female coworker who was involved with it or was the original requester. And I mean, all of that aside, even if she was the original requester, all of the the fallout from this 
is obviously not acceptable. And so, you know, chatted through it and made it clear that that this was my request, that this was not hers, and that it was this was heard by everyone on the floor. And and so had the convers follow-up conversations with my coworker as well and talked through it. And that was pretty early in my exposure to these issues. And maybe not ironically, she ended up being one of the main allyship mentors that I've mm -hmm. mentioned. And even to this day, within the last you know number of weeks, I reach out to her to say, hey, I'm in this situation at work. I have these yeah. team members or I have these colleagues. I'm seeing this. I want to know what's the best way that I can address this, both for the woman involved, as well as how do I use this as powerful of a teaching moment as it could be for the man involved or whatever the situation is. So there are a couple of things that I, I've taken from that. One is the willingness to be involved and to question yourself is important, yeah. but then the willingness to continue to, to show humility. Like, I, I don't know everything and I will never know everything. And especially yeah. in this space, there's only so much that I, I jokingly said before, like a third party observer, I, I'm a man. I will never have the experience in the workplace that a woman mm -hmm. will have. And understanding that and being willing to accept that is something that is hugely important in allyship because what I've seen is that that builds connections and relationships across that gender divide that is really the only path forward, right? Like mm -hmm. if, if I go chat with my male colleagues about this, I can get some thoughts and I can get some insights, but it's, it's never going to be as impactful as a woman's point of view when it is an issue in this area. And so building those relationships, showing that willingness, that vulnerability, the humility to say, I don't know what the right answer is here. I don't know what your experience is. I don't know what women's experience is in general. That, that's the only way to build that type of a relationship where there's that mutual trust, which mm -hmm. they also understand my my intent, where I'm coming from. And so they also know that they can always call me on my crap. <laughs> and <laughs> and that because, you know, you talked about the intimidation on the uh, male side of being a male ally, but it's, I can only imagine it's that much more intimidating on the female side to call potential male allies on their crap, because, especially... Is. <laughs> especially because it goes back to that whole he's a good person they're a good person mm -hmm. issue where it's like if you don't have that relationship that mutual trust built up that it is a safe place to call someone on something then I can imagine it would be challenging because it's like no they're a good person they're trying they're you know they're engaged they're doing their thing but still if if it's not called out those subconscious biases are terrible. <laughs> They're yeah. very difficult to address. Yeah. And also I'm a good person, right? I don't yeah. want to be the, Ex I don't want exactly. to be the person calling you out. I don't want to make you yeah. feel bad. And that's something I personally have had to overcome that it's for the benefit of everyone. If we can mm -hmm. have those candid conversations, but like you said, it has to come from a place of trust first. Yeah. I, I also think what you said was such an important takeaway for allies that the best way to build connection and trust is to center female voices or mm -hmm. whatever allyship space you're in. Center the stories that you're trying to hear. Ask the people directly, right? Yeah. Don't go talk to your bros about it. Go yeah. ask someone <laughs> yeah. who's living the experience mm -hmm. and believe what they say. Like if we could just believe women, if we could just all start by believing women, we would yeah. all be better allies. Oh, yeah. I think that's so incredible. One last takeaway. If there's anything you would want to leave with, with male allies, what would you tell them to do? get started, find women in your space, in your peer group, and start asking questions. Like you said, uh, center the woman voice. That's the only way that we can, as men, identify the issues and start to unpack our own biases. And beyond that, I'm going to shout you out for one thing that's been helpful in the things that you've shared at Divi specifically, you brought this up a number of times, was don't be afraid to bring things up in the moment immediately mm. on the spot in front of anyone and everyone 
And there are going to be situations where maybe it's better to follow up. It's maybe better to have one-on-one -on -one conversations, but I appreciate the way that you've framed it, where you've talked about have a word, have a response, have something that's basically in your back pocket yes. that when you see something, you whip that thing out immediately. And mm -hmm. the examples you've had is like it's something as simple as, ooh, like, yes. did you want to say that? Like, ouch, whatever your flavor of that is, which... I've used that and I've like regularly used that because it's like, there's a big difference. We just have to be cognizant of both the man and the woman involved if there is yes. a gender interaction. And like in some cases, something lighthearted and easy like that is going to call attention to it for the man involved. And it's going to show the woman involved that someone has their back. Yes. And if it was made into a bigger thing, then it would probably have a na more negative impact potentially on both parties mm -hmm. if you actually called out and you're like listen buddy that was sexist and misogynistic <laughs> and not okay because then maybe the woman gets more embarrassed by that and the man gets aggressive it's more confrontational yeah so i've i've appreciated your recommendation for that like i said i've used it and those the timely advice contextualizing it right in the moment so everyone knows exactly what isn't okay is yeah. i think really impactful so get started and have your catchphrase in your back pocket <laughs> so you can call out you know this uh, type of behavior immediately and in the moment oh i love that and i love calling it a catchphrase allies really are, are superheroes <laughs> yeah. right so we should have catchphrases kudos to michael for showing up and getting started in gender allyship as he shared, allyship gets easier the more you learn and the more women you listen to. As long as you stay curious about the problems that exist for others, you'll learn to see what used to be invisible. At the end of each episode, I'll share an allyship micro action that you can start using today. Michael already shared a couple. Join your women's ERG. Find an allyship mentor. Keep a one word phrase in your back pocket so you can respond to sexism right away. I'll share one more allyship action with you. Amplify women's voices. This tactic has an interesting backstory. Obama was the first sitting president to self-identify as a feminist. One third of his top aides were women, the most diverse presidential administration to that date. Despite this, women in the Oval Office were still being ignored. So Obama's female staffers took a different tack. These women adopted a meeting strategy called amplification. When a woman made a key point, the allies in the room restated the idea and gave credit to the woman who said it. It's genius and incredibly easy to replicate. When you hear a woman or underestimated voice speak up in a meeting, amplify their comment. Say, I liked Jalen's idea to do this because, or I want to reiterate this tactic that Veronica brought up. I'll add that. Or, thanks, Deepa, for bringing up this idea. I really appreciate your perspective. Amplification is not groupthink or repeating bad ideas. It's making sure that every voice is heard and that women are celebrated for their contributions. One other thing that I really love about this allyship tactic is that as the women in the Obama administration started amplifying each other's voices more, Obama actually changed his behavior. He noticed what they were doing, and he started calling on women and junior aides more often. Whether or not you are a leader in your organization, you can impact change by amplifying women's voices. Next time. Regardless of your pain and what causes it, if you're in an equitable relationship, that pain matters. Your work does not exist separate from your life. And a good ally should be willing to acknowledge where work is going to take from life. Thanks for listening and see you next time. Learn more. Do better.